Sure. Happy to share. Um, so this is uh, what I'll be talking about is a, a framework that I put together for um, kind of understanding DAOs and analyzing them and um, trying to identify weaknesses or things that can be better. Um, so the first, uh, so we'll just kind of talk about like, what do I mean by, you know, roasting a DAO? Um, we're not like making fun of the DAO um, generally. Um, we're just trying to understand like what the DAO does versus what they what they say that they do um, and see what we can and see how we can apply this throughout um, the ecosystem as a tool to help make DAOs better. So at its core, what we're doing when we're roasting a DAO is comparing what the DAO says they do publicly on Twitter, on forums, on wherever um, versus what they actually do. And what I mean by what they actually do is like looking at the smart contracts and seeing uh, how are votes taking place? Um, how is governance uh, actually distributed within this DAO? Um, how are proposals executed once they are ratified? Like, is it a trustless process? Is it like a single person who is still an admin? Um, are there some random people that can veto things in this DAO? Like, there's all this kind of stuff behind the scenes of in, in DAO smart contracts, um, which you might not know about if you're just kind of like reading um, what the DAO publicly says they do. They say, hey, we give grants and we're decentralized and we're run by our community, but what's actually going on under the hood. Um, so we can also think of this like a, a configuration audit. It's distinct from a smart contract audit because generally like the smart contracts have been audited and they're and they're like uh and they're and they're fine if they've if they're well adopted, but it's still very easy to actually like misconfigure this stuff. Um, and uh, given how let's see, depending on how fast I get through this um uh, and depending on how many questions i can also give some previews of my uh devcon talk which i finished yesterday which is also about exploiting misconfigurations in DAOs. um so maybe we'll do like a, a double header depending on uh if how many questions people have so in order to be a good DAO roaster it's important to be especially in the ethereum ecosystem it's important to be very proficient with navigating ether scan um, reading contract, reading the reading code, decoding event logs, um, navigating the Gnosis UI beyond just transactions, but also like the settings and modules that a, that a DAO might have enabled on their treasuries. Um, also understanding how to navigate uh, snapshot, um, snapshot settings, and um, using their API a bit. Um, so um, we also need to know what all the contracts are for a DAO. Sometimes that's actually pretty hard. Like a DAO might exist on Twitter or in Discord, but then when you go to figure out like where does this DAO's money actually exist, like sometimes that's harder to find than you might think. Or maybe they have operating budgets, which are that which certain working groups use. Um, this is actually pretty rarely documented well. Certain DAOs like DX DAO, which I've started preparing roasts on, document this stuff very well. Um, but most communities, um, this stuff you really have to like dig through and just ask members where this stuff is. Um, we also need to understand what is, what is the DAO actually saying that they do? Are they just like a DAO that exists for the purpose of uh, being more of a social club, or is this something with real uh, with like real intentions, um, real meaning? Like not that social clubs are not real, me real meaning like uh, how high impact or how like uh, critical is it for them to um, have like good security and stuff. So we have this like template where um, we can we can think about as we're going through this stuff, typically I put this up on a whiteboard um, and we just try to find, um, do some like uh, intelligence gathering about a DAO where we try to find what are all the relevant links? What's their website? What's their docs? Um, what's their, what are all the ENF names they control? Any like main ether scan links that show DAO activity? Um, how are proposals made? Are they made just on snapshot? Or are they like compound style proposals where you uh, have to have a certain percentage of total votes in order to even submit a proposal. Um, or are they Moloch style proposals where anyone can submit, but they have to be sponsored? Like um, there's so many different flavors of what's going on that it's important to like just dive in and understand that. And then how are they executed? Um, can they be executed by anybody? Um, is there a time lock? Um, there's all of these like random like little things that uh, go into how, how DAOs actually operate. Um, we also wanna know where their treasury is, how is power distributed? Is there any way for us to understand uh, based on holders, is there any like civil resistance or could the, somebody have a hundred addresses and have like a hundred votes, but we don't realize it's all the same person. Um, and then we like to just highlight things that we think this DAO has done well um, and things that this DAO could improve on. 
So the first DAO that we chose to roast was Nouns. Um, Massive Treasury does a lot of act actual on-chain activity, um, pretty, uh, has cool little characters as their DAO shares. Um, and so when over the summer, uh, we all got together at this fancy table um, and decided to do our first DAO roast. So we didn't have a, we didn't have a, a format in mind yet, um, but this had just kind of emerged as we were sitting around the table figuring out um, how would we actually audit a DAO. What we came up with um, is like, this, this is a little summary of, uh, of, of the nouns information. So when you want to look at, uh, when you want to uh, start playing around with nouns, in fact, I'm going to minimize this so that I can uh, show you guys other links. Nouns' its homepage is just nouns.wtf. Um, so we can start to see, we can see uh, information about the treasury. Again, absolutely massive amount of ETH. We can look at their auctions for new DAO shares and scroll back and forth in time. Um, we can see links to the DAO or we can see proposals, um, proposals that have been executed or defeated or, um, or canceled or things that are, are currently being voted on. Um, for things that are being voted on, we can see how, how people are voting. Um, and so like this is an example of actually a very accessible DAO um, because just by going to their website, for, for one, many DAOs don't have a website. Um, but in this case, they've really put a lot of effort into showing uh, what is going on in this in this community. There's also a couple, we also found a couple like useful uh, Dune, let's see. Those links are all linking to the wrong place. Um, also found a couple interesting like Dune analytics dashboards. Um, and so we can see like, um, maybe even if people are controlling multiple addresses, how many like distinct addresses hold nouns. Um, we can look at like proposals over time, um, voter turnout. So like these are all, and we didn't have to make any of this. This is all like super useful stuff that people have already created in the community that helps us when we're trying to uh, audit or roast a DAO. Um, so when we identified, when we looked to see how our proposal is made, we saw that you needed to have at least uh, two nouns to submit a proposal. Uh, but when I dug into the contracts, uh, that number will go up over time because it's it's actually percentage based. And so I think it's like you have to have one per like at least one percent of the overall supply or something like that, and it's rounded up. Um, uh, so the amount of nouns that you need to make a proposal is is going to actually increase over time. Not called out in the docs, but you can find that in the smart contracts. Um, the nouns can be delegated. That's front and center. It's very good for people to be able to delegate their votes. Um, it's one noun, one vote. Um, and the votes happen here. And then how are proposals actually executed? Um, so before going into it, I had no idea. It was like nouns is an NFT. Maybe the multi-sig just does what the NFT holders to say. Um, instead, they've actually created this really interesting uh, NFT-based fork of uh, compound governance. Uh, so compound style governance is normally used with um, ERC-20s. Um, so uh, they, but they went in and created a, a uh, special flavor of those governance rules, but instead using NFTs um, as the voting shares. Um, and they've had that audited and everything and everything's super well uh, documented in their code. So what that means is that proposals are actually entirely on chain. When you go in and uh, I'll go to like my fork of nouns, which I actually have the ability to uh, make proposals on, um, you can, actually add transactions. So like if you want the DAO to take a certain action, um, you can say like, okay, I want the DAO uh, to send me, uh, you know, 0 0.01 ETH. Um, you can also have it interact with smart contracts and stuff. And everything that you actually put into the proposal automatically gets executed if the proposal passes. So this to me is already like quite cool. Um, because there are so many DAOs out there that just have like off-chain voting or whatever, and then the multi-sig holders get together and uh, generally do what they want. But um, uh, this is much more like direct governance. So that was a pretty cool point to learn. Um, they also say that they issue one noun per day um, and that uh, one out of 10 nouns go to the founding team for uh, for five years. This was all pretty uh, easy to confirm um, in the smart contract. 
Um, and yeah, the fork is live. We've actually had it live for about a week. Um, we made this like, I'll, I'll get into our, our fork in a moment. Uh, it's pretty cool how it's how it's playing out. Um, so uh, the nounders are the founding team and they get one out of 10 nouns. Um, this is all actually quite easy to validate in the smart contracts. Um, but uh, one thing that I found was that like, it says it's a noun per day uh, forever. Um, that actually can change through governance. Like the we found that the contracts are upgradable, and so if for some reason the DAO wanted to, they could tomorrow vote to make it so that nouns come out every fifteen minutes. They probably wouldn't do that, um, but I thought that that was like kind of an interesting thing. That's like they don't say that it's mutable, but technically they could change whatever they want um, with enough of uh, enough nouns holders to vote for it. Um, where's their treasury? Um, we can plainly see on Etherscan, they say they have 29,000 ETH, and indeed they have like 24,000 ETH plus like 4,600 4, staked ETH, so math checks out. It's an absolutely massive treasury. Um, and what's the distribution of governance? So it's like 200 something unique holders, but we don't really know because these people might be using multiple addresses. There's, there's no civil... Uh, there's no like civil resistance or or anything factored into the voting system. So there's actually quite a lot of kudos here. Like uh, Nows is a very sophisticated DAO. I'd say it's very much on chain native, um, and they generally do what they say they do. Um, the contracts being upgradable does mean that the it can change over time um, at the permission of the DAO, um, but that's not super clear when it's like if you're getting into the DAO thinking like I'm doing this one thing and then 90% of the other holders decide to vote to change the rules you're I mean that's uh that's something that you have to consider so that's something that we thought that they could call out more is that technically everything is upgradable um that they also have this concept of veto power because I think they have no idea who owns how many nouns um they are there is some concern about like some sort of hostile takeover where Someone comes in, they accumulated all power or bribed a lot of people. Um, the founders actually still to this day maintain uh, veto power. Um, and that's been a, a point of some conflict in the community just because they're trying to figure out at what point and how would we phase this out. Uh, but they're still trying to figure out how exactly to do that. Um, so it's also hard to it's hard to know what the actual governance distribution is. Um, it'd be nice if maybe people were more uh, like public about like, hey, I control these five wallets. Um, and that's why I collectively have 20 nouns and votes. Um, but they don't technically have to do that. So these were some of our early findings. Uh, another exercise that we did um, was to map out their smart contracts. So when I was digging through Etherscan and clicking around, um, going from like nouns treasury, like reading the nouns treasury contract and seeing, okay, there's an admin, click that. What is this contract called? This is called a proxy. Uh, and then like reading that and trying to find like, um, okay, this one also has an admin. Um, and so like, it's uh, it was a little confusing just trying to click around either scan. So I just, uh, another useful thing I, I like to do is just visually see what all the main interfaces between all the different contracts are. Um, Cause the nouns that was not just one contract. It's like nine. Um, they have the original founders, which control a Gnosis safe. Um, this has no administrative controls over the over the rest of the, the DAO. There's a separate multi-sig, which has veto power. Um, and actually, the founders of this one are, uh, as far as I can tell, anonymous, which is a little, uh, like, if you can go to Gnosis safe, um, app, ETH. And we can see this is the... Um, this is the multi-sig that has like 300 ETH in it. Um, and we can see the owners, uh, but it's uh, you have to kind of dig through Etherscan more to try to figure out who these people are. A cool thing about the Gnosis UI is that you can have, uh, you can build up your own address book. So this person that I'm tagging as person two, I can kind of go in and tag this as like, you know, person three. Anywhere else in the entire Gnosis ecosystem, if I like go to another Gnosis safe, um, your address book is yours alone. Um, so if I then like go to another DAO and I click on the owners, it'll maintain my tags. Um, so that's just like a super handy thing if you're like navigating Gnosis a lot. You can build up your own um, 
you can build up your own address book. Like this is my address book of like people that I've tagged on Gnosis um, just so that I can like keep track of things as I'm navigating around. So this was the, uh, this is the map of the smart contracts. Um, there were some good things, which is like the executor, which is controlled only by the DAO is the thing that has the ability to add new traits to the NFTs, the ability to change the auction or pause the auction, um, the ability to upgrade the DAO itself. Um, so they really have like uh, the majority, the vast majority of the control of all of the contracts is actually handled by um, the DAO itself, which is quite nice. Um, the only thing that's weird, like I've said, is the veto. Um, it'd be, I think that they've actually, since I made this, um, they've uh, released some plans on how they're planning to update over time, perhaps introduce some concept of like a rate limited veto where like proposals below X amount of spending, they don't have any veto ability. But if someone like tries to send half the treasury to some, I don't know, random address, um, they could step in. So uh, I think that they could also just kind of make it more of a community elected board of vetoers. Um, maybe that has its own risks as well. Um, that's really the only thing that we've that uh, I uh, that we called out on them. So trying to figure out who the multi sig holders are, um, something that you can do is like take their name, um, take the take an address, um, and then just go to uh, OpenSea.io slash that address. It's like super handy, um, and you can not only see all their NFTs, um, you can see their ENS names, and so that's how like. If you ever have an address that you're like, I wonder who owns this address. The one of the first places I look is just OpenSea.io slash address, and then I can see like uh, Dora.eth, and then I go to like Twitter, um, and I search for like Dora.eth, um, and then I try to like find that person. Uh, and I don't know if this person will come up, but like some a lot of times if people have it in their profile name, it's a very easy way to go from like address to person I can contact, um, except Etherscan just added like direct person to person messaging, which I think is awesome. And I really hope this gets adopted. Um, but you can like connect, uh, you can like connect, oops, no, wrong one. You can connect a uh, wallet and do like encrypted end to end uh, chats with any other address. And so I, I haven't used this yet, but next time I'm doing some like kind of DAO open source intelligence, I might try to like uh, message addresses on Etherscan and be like, hey, who are you? Like, what do you like? Uh, can you tell me about this? Uh, so that's another thing that I'm very excited about. I'm going to add to my DAO, uh, my DAO roasting toolkit. Um, so yeah, that's just good to be like Etherscan, Snapshot, Gnosis, and like just kind of a uh, tracking all this stuff. Another tool that I like to use when I'm doing this is um, breadcrumbs. Um, it's like an open source uh, chain analysis where you can grab, um, let's see. You can, let's see if I'm signed in. Nope. Um, so breadcrumbs is a tool that allows you to like enter in an address um, and see all of the um, all of the funds going in and out of it, and various address and various other addresses that they're interacting with. Um, so if I do Ethereum and I put the nouns address, uh, the nouns treasury address, it very it like immediately. This is a completely free tool. Um, it immediately lets you like kind of see uh, if there's any like big uh, any like oh looks like. The treasury sent a bunch of ETH to this address, and then it went back here, and then it looks like they bought more nouns. So it's like you can you can do a little bit of um, analysis on a DAO's treasury um, just by throwing it into a tool like this, um, and immediately maybe like learn some cool stuff. Um, let's see, what is a Zach X B T D M? Anyway, Rashad, feel free. So to that's 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 pretty, that's a Twitter handle uh, who does um, like um, investigation on chain investigation of all rug pulls and you know uh, different uh, uh, scam projects. Oh, cool. So he 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 predominantly uses this tool uh, 
uh, breadcrumbs to you know oh, to nice. check out all wallets of you know all these scammers and you know uh, make maps of of these addresses so you can see that like you know uh, if you saw that uh, pretty cool that is really cool i will uh i will follow him closely that's awesome so this dude so this dude has done like a uh, crazy amount of uh, investigations into different kind of rug pulls and different kind of uh, stamp projects uh Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Very good resource. Which can lead into a little bit of other topics unless uh which I can I can <laughs> share unless uh people have some other questions about uh auditing DAOs and stuff. Yeah, so uh, uh I, I have a question around uh, auditing DAOs, right? Um uh, uh, uh nouns is quite big, uh, but what 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 do you feel that um all all these new DAOs that are coming in or you know all the new DAOs that are being formed um they go about creating their own smart contracts and um uh, then getting it audited um do you do you think like that is the only uh way to do things or there should be like um uh, easier DAO builders or you know there should be easier DAO templates that can be used um yeah. uh, to to avoid all of this setup that any sort of DAO has to undergo these days um yes i think that it would be nice if there were more there are a lot of guided tools i think most people when they're creating DAOs don't actually go into the process of like creating their own smart contracts um and in fact if you do like the nouns architecture um they are the most easily forkable product i've ever seen they've made it um so nice as a developer to go in and like you can download the code install and have That's a right. whole version of it running on your local system in minutes like I've never seen a project as easy to fork um so generally new DAOs that are forming shouldn't be messing with the smart contracts too much and even if they are maybe they right. shouldn't be messing with um governance um, unless they're willing to go through um smart contract audits but beyond smart contract audits to me like it's even more important to talk about configuration audits because like you can set up your DAO using standard tools and still be vulnerable just by like putting like bad settings in place. That's right. So uh, yeah, I mean that is another uh, thing to look at, right? Uh, all these parameters that you set for a DAO are probably uh, the framework that you want to follow, right? Uh, not everyone would uh, probably want to uh, follow some something like a nouns DAO, or or mm. probably not every DAO would have a structure as as um as massive as the nouns DAO, right yeah uh, so uh, there, there could be DAOs which are more simple which just have a treasury and you know just have a governance module and uh, th that's it right probably not not something which is creating an auction every day right so uh what what for these kind of DAOs, right i mean nouns probably is is the epitome of of DAOs that exist today right? yeah um uh what what uh, what do you think um uh, should be the case for simpler DAOs uh sure. that has uh just you know basic basic structure and you know how should they go about doing things well i will uh present you a couple slides from my talk that i finished yesterday for my devcon talk next week um Amazing. so uh the purpose of this talk is to kind of talk about standard configuration so most a lot of DAOs will start as a new safe a token a snapshot um, and maybe they want gasless voting and then but like real on-chain execution so they'll use like snap safe or something like that um and so right. what i'm what i'm going to be talking about next week and what i can show you guys right now um is how like through using those tools i was able to like um steal money from a dao in like a white hat like you know uh honeypot exploiter kind of way um for research purposes uh and how this is all like using and how there's like a ton of DAOs out there that can just make very simple fixes um, that uh, make that that make them like much more uh, much less vulnerable. Um, so uh, what I've been what I'm kind of referring to it as is like you know proof of inattention, um, where a lot of DAOs if they're configured in a way where like they rely on their members to pay attention. Um, makes them quite vulnerable maybe that's obvious but like uh um there are so many tools out there that you know if you join 50 
DAOs. And then like, if you go away on vacation one week and people can steal money from it, um, to me, that's a pretty bad design. So um, a lot of DAOs use, uh, and I'll skip through this and I don't need to be the whole thing, um, but a lot of DAOs use this like reality.eth uh, module, which makes their snapshot votes executable on chain. Um, and the way that that looks, uh, if we go to reality.eth, um, and let's see, use the DAP. So what this looks like on snapshot, um, let's see, takes a little bit to load. No reality. What it looks like on snapshot is like when you do a vote, um, if they have the the reality module enabled, it'll be like, okay, what's the transaction associated with uh, with this vote? Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, come on, reality is a funny. Uh, phrase. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, but this is a very configure. This is a very um, straightforward configuration that many many DAOs use. Like the a lot of NFT collecting DAOs will use this. Um, a lot of DAOs with like kind of small to medium treasuries. So like even like a few ETH or something um, will use a module like this. The parameters let you do whatever you want though. And like this is one of my problems with tools like this is that it it gives you this big menu of options, but it doesn't throw up any red flags when it's like, hey, if you set up, um, if you set this up, then like you could lose your money in 24 hours if you like, I don't know, get on a flight to Singapore from New York. By the time you land, you could lose your money. Like these are very real things that a lot of DAOs are are vulnerable to, um, that it just feels like you're just setting up a an or a, a system on your DAO. So in this case, um, reality.eth is an oracle, which brings um, snapshot votes on chain to be executed. And so they give you this big list of parameters. They're like, okay, set the timeout, set the cooldown, um, set the expiration, set the bond, set the arbitrator, set the template. Like that's all like whatever. Like if you want to do an hour of research, maybe you'll figure out what a reasonable configuration is. Um, but it's very easy to be like, well, timeout, okay. Uh, I want people to be able to answer for one day. Um, and cool down, okay, well, I want it to be executable um, 12 hours after it's finalized, um, and it's executable for a week. And it's like, as you're setting up your DAO as a new DAO, you might be optimistic about how much people are going to pay attention, um, but then you get to the point where um, it takes seven days to even get people to sign a multi-sig transaction um, on like a three of five or something, then you realize like, oh, crap, attention is really scarce. And I actually say like, attention is the most scarce resource in DAOs. And so you must design accordingly. So what happens normally in reality.eth is there's a vote. You ask the oracle. Somebody honest comes along and answers it. Or typically, the person who asks is also the person that answers. And then it gets executed. Um, but what people don't realize is with reality.eth, you don't even have to make a proposal on Snapshot. You can go right to Etherscan and like make a completely fraudulent, malicious thing that's like, hey, did this? Uh, non-existent proposal pass in the DAO, um, and then you can answer immediately. So without bypassing the UI, bypassing everything, you can go in and craft a malicious, uh, a malicious question to the Oracle, which if no one's paying attention, um, or if reality.eth is happening to not happening, uh, to not load for them that day, uh, your money's gone. Um, and so like I've seen, I actually saw, um, beyond the exploit that I did, uh, on the Gnosis uh, honeypot um, last week, somebody posted on Twitter that uh, Gnosis safes were getting exploited. Um, so this person from this opium network, um, they they noticed that their DAO was somebody was trying to exploit them, and they found like seven other transactions of the same person doing it to other DAOs. Um, and unfortunately for the first DAO, it was an easy target because they set 24-hour cooldowns, no arbitrator, um, and like, it was just a DAO that was kind of sitting there it had seven and a half ETH in the treasury. Um, and within, uh, 24 hours, they were, this is their, what, this is what their fraudulent thing looked like. It looked, it looks fine. Like, unless you know what you're looking for this, the fact that the proposal ID is dead, um, is a, is a sign, but that's just laziness on the attacker's part. They could have made this look even more legit. Um, so they crafted this malicious proposal. They answered it. They put down a bond of a hundred bucks. Um, and they were able to seal seven and a half ETH within 24 hours because this DAO configured 
their uh, Oracle in such a way that was like only had 24 hour periods. Um, so even if they had noticed, maybe they wouldn't have been, been able to get their multi-sig signers together to veto it. Um, and then I saw seven other attacks um, where they were trying to steal like tens of millions of dollars worth of assets from other DAOs. Um, and so what I did is I went in and I answered the Oracle questions honestly, but to do that, I had to put down like eight ETH. Like I had to like, with, I had to like pull, the, pull together a bunch of uh, like ETH that I could find and use it to try to like defend these Gnosis safes from these like malicious answers. If that attacker had come back and like doubled my bond and put down four, I would have then had to come up with 32 ETH to defend them. And you could very quickly see how a well-capitalized attacker combined with people maybe not paying attention. And I, if I didn't see this tweet, I wouldn't have done this. Um, a well-capitalized attacker could make it very expensive to uh, to protect uh, no like safes against this style of attack. Um, so uh, yeah, even like uh, right like normal like little DAO treasuries, um, if you configure them in in such a way, like it's it's uh, very easy to um, to lose money. Isaac, did you uh, get the dishonest bonds? So I know that they're only 0.1 ETH, but it's just an interesting like game theoretic thing, right? Yes. Like they could have doubled up and it would have been like well capitalized. But like you do benefit if you answer honesty and like are proven to be correct. Yes, you do. Um, but you kind of reach a paradox. Um, like like in game theory, there's like the concept of a dollar auction, which is like two people are bidding on a dollar. Um, but the person that wins gets the gets the second place bidder's um, uh, bid as well, and it start like the um, it starts with like someone bids ten cents, cool, ninety cent profit. Someone else is like, okay, fifteen cents. Now I get eighty five percent, eighty five cent profit or whatever, and they keep going until they're both bidding ninety nine cents, and then so, and then the second place person's like, well, crap, if I lose, I'm. Uh, uh, then they become they then they just try to start cutting their losses and they say okay well I'm gonna bid a dollar five for this dollar just so I don't lose my ninety nine cents and then like you kind of reach this um, game theoretic like paradox where it's like two people are spending way too much money um, on something that's worth less than what they're spending on just so that they're not the one that loses and so like reality uh, if you don't set an arbitrator and stuff is a paradox like it should not be used uh and yet people put it on their DAOs all the time so uh yes but i did i did claim the the dishonest eth but i'm trying to get in touch with the DAO that had their eth stolen to try to uh help them get recover some stuff because the i was able to recover a little bit of it but the attacker was able to um uh sneak it out once they saw that I was defending, they ran away with whatever they still, with the remaining ETH that they stole. Um, but yeah. There's not really a good alternative to reality.eth. Um, uh, just because like, it's kind of a flawed system from this. I mean, you can use it. Uh, you just have to like set up a lot of monitoring infrastructure to make sure people aren't trying to exploit you. It's just my problem with these like optimistic consensus systems are that they all assume that people are paying attention. And if you're in DAOs, you know that people are never paying attention. And so you can use systems like this, but you have to like basically set up on-call schedules, text message pings, make sure your multi-sig signers are always around. Like it's high, high responsibility to use systems like this, which are really only saving you gas. You might as well just do on-chain voting. The way that I've heard reality described is that it only allows people to execute proposals once they have been passed on snapshots. But this uh, timeline that you've showed and the ability to craft malicious proposals that don't even go through the interface is uh, like particularly interesting. Yeah. And I wonder if that might lead you because you've shown like a little bit about like familiarity with Etherscan, a little bit about familiarity with the safe. Uh, mm -hmm. and like breadcrumbs and some of these other useful tools. We haven't really looked at Snapshot yet. I wonder if that might be something you would uh, also just take us through. Yeah. Um, so let me go to, this is an executable Snapshot proposal. 
Um, so this is a little test DAO. We wanted to send point zero 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 one ETH to a certain thing. And this is the transaction that would get executed. Um, and it was going through the reality Oracle. Um, so the kind of cross check that you do is like, you look at the question on reality and see if the snapshot UI matches. Um, that's also kind of weak in my opinion, because like snapshot relies on the graph, which is like pretty good, but that's not exactly reading perfect data. Um, it's also vulnerable potentially to front end attacks. And so like, uh, um, anyway, so this is, this is snapshot. Um, and the, the thing that you should do as a person answering questions on reality.eth, um, is like when you see a question, uh, you should, uh, cross-reference it with snapshot. Um, but I, uh, like this is a, here's a new one to me. I saw this come in and I was like, oh no, more fraud. Turns out this one's legit. Um, but the thing that I had to do to determine that it was legit, uh, was go to snapshots API. Um, one of my main problems with them is that they make this way too hard. So I have to put in the proposal ID. Okay. This is a proposal for the me bits DAO. So let me go here, edit the URL. Um, they could make this as easy as a button, but they make it so hard to do the right thing. Um, and then I do this. Okay. Here's a proposal and it looks like the batch transaction hash is eight, three, five, two, two, whatever ending in zero six. And now I go back to the reality.eth question and I do see, uh, actually that does not seem to match. Is this a fraudulent one? Um, let's see. Yeah. Maybe this one's fraud too. Um, batch transaction hash eight, three, five, two, two E. I thought I checked this one the other day and it seemed fine. Uh, yeah, this does not, this looks sketchy to me. Five, two, six. Do we see this anywhere on this page? Oh, complete transaction hash. I was just misused reading the UI. Again, they make this so hard. Like they could make it so that it's like, uh, so that it, when you're actually using this UI, that it's just a button that takes you there and highlights the thing. Um, but uh, so yeah, here's, you have to kind of be able to navigate um, snapshot. When you're looking at a DAO, if you want to know if the DAO has the reality.eth thing enabled, you go to their settings um, and, uh, and you go to plugins. Um, so they have, uh, the snapshot thing, another, I think the biggest DAO on snapshot that I saw is using this module is one inch. Uh, so we can go down and see that, um, one inch is using the safe snap thing. Um, and then I was like digging around their contracts and I was very worried because they have like $20 million in their treasury. And, uh, I messaged with their devs and they said, it's fine. It's safe. We have monitoring infrastructure set up. Um, but still like big, like, uh, multi-million dollar treasuries are using this tool. Um, and like, there's not really an accepted best practice on how to set it up. It's just like, you're kind of on your own. Uh, I have shared this with Fabian, uh, but, uh, that snapshot, um, but if you can always, uh, I, I always appreciate more, more pressuring to get them to make the UI better and to make it easier to do the right thing. You have to make it easy to do the right thing. Um, I made a little like, keep your DAO safe slide that I'm gonna try to like share at DevCon. Huh. And maybe this like leads us also into like just a little bit of a discussion that around like governance minimization in general, you know, so like some of the folks in kernel have been asking about Rye and have been asking about uh, like governments. Rye is an awesome use case. I would love to talk about Rye. Please. Um, this what I don't want to interrupt is if anyone else has comments. Cool. So Rye is kind of a, is kind of a really funny use case because, um, it's supposed to be set up for ungovernance, um, which is like, you don't, the system should be self-correcting. 
And so if you're not familiar with Rai, it is a, rather than a stable coin, I like to think of it as a smooth coin where like it's not pegged to anything but itself. And so it can drift over time, um, but it always tries to maintain the same price through like uh, through market pressures. The way that it tries to maintain that price um, is by changing the redemption rate um, of your loan. And so it works similar to DAI. You borrow RAI, um, you have to deposit collateral, and then you to mint new RAI into existence, you borrow against ETH. Um, and it just it, it tweaks some stuff to make it like make it more incentivized, make it so that people are more incentivized to mint a bunch of RAI and flood the market if the price is too uh, if the price is too high. And it incentivizes people to kind of like pay back their loans if the price is too low. And it's just these two actions, but it's kind of confusing. I actually, it took me, it took somebody almost an entire day of explaining to me how it works because uh, I'm not a DeFi person. So it took me, and I'm probably not good at explaining it, but Rai is supposed to be self, uh, self-sustaining self and you shouldn't have to do any governance proposals. I think there's been zero governance proposals, um, but this summer uh, there was there the first, for the first time, I think they were like, maybe we should do a proposal um, because the price of Rai kept falling. And it kept falling because people since July, it was started out over three dollars. Now it's two eighty three, and it kept falling because people weren't doing the right thing. They weren't doing the profitable thing, and they weren't doing the profitable thing because it just complicated enough um, that they didn't make it quite easy enough. Like basically, I want there to be a button that's like, do the profitable rye thing on their website. Instead, you go to like your dashboard, you open a safe, you deposit ETH, you withdraw collateral, you sell your collateral for a, a different stable coin. And like to a person that's familiar with Rye, they're like, duh. Uh, but to someone else, they're like, wait, what do I do? You want me to buy Rye? He's like, no, 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 you should mint and dump Rye. And it's like people, it's not intuitive. And so even like ungoverned systems like Rye still need a button that's just like do the profit thing. Um, in order for that to really work. One of the interesting things about this is that like, uh, with Rai, it's easy to understand, right? Like, because there is like some quantifiable thing. It's, it's interesting to me that you said like, do the profitable thing, not the right thing. Yeah. Cause like that, that's really cool. Like, cool. We can do governance minimized systems where profitable is a measurable and quantifiable thing that like doesn't yeah. have like, uh, like morality associated. You're just like, okay, like do the thing. It opens profitable space, thing is the right thing for Rai. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting, but like in these more social tools, like Gitcoin or uh not so safe itself now that it's launched to talk on these kinds of things you know like a lot of the people are concerned about like what is the like right thing uh which is not always the most profitable thing and yeah. so like where is the middle ground there or do you have like interesting work that you've seen that is trying to kind of find that place where you have the call to just enough attention to make informed decisions without overwhelming people in an attention scarce economy. Yeah, um, definitely not a solved problem. I was looking at some of the bribery tools this summer, um, like stake DAO, I think it's called, um, and invisible hand, where um, protocols can just straight up bribe token holders to vote a certain way. Um, which maybe is not going to be, which probably is more towards like the, we want you to do the profitable thing. Um, but if the right people, well-intentioned people are bribing the people, then it's both profitable and good. Uh, so I, I'm conflicted about these like vote bribery systems um, because like you get more voter turnout, uh, but it's like could very obviously be the, uh, used in in a bad way um so yeah uh i would love to learn from someone who uh has better better ideas on that yeah we can uh get into a lot of escrow tokens on the curve wars uh mm -hmm. in another episode of, yeah <laughs> uh, in our roasts because there's some fascinating stuff there we were on uh, token communities call the other day talking about ocean which is also just released to like a ve token model and it seems to be increasingly yeah. popular it remains to be seen whether it's a good idea or not 
Ocean's, uh, um, I, if, yeah, they also did a Rye Fork, I think. They did? That's I think true. So, uh, yes. uh, yeah, so maybe we can do some experimentation with, like, more clever Rye stuff with, uh, with bribing. That would be fun. We could do, like, a, <laughs> a thing where people are bribed to do something that makes them money. I mean, I'm, I'm very, as you know, I'm very available for this kind of stuff, particularly in the context of like educational organizations like Kernel. Are we going to run some on like each block should have its own currency kind of stuff. And if we can, uh, if we can play around with some bribery and uh, potential corruption for good. <laughs> yeah, I love how you put it earlier, like white hats and, uh, you know, for research purposes. That's one that every, everything can happen for for research purposes. And yeah. <laughs> swear to stick to that. There's, I, there's one other thing that I would like to get to uh, in this, uh, but please, if you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask now, otherwise, it would be really wonderful to hear a little bit more about public nouns and the fork and, and what's going, did I see 78 ETH in the treasury? Like what is happening there? Isaac? Like, yeah. So we released this on uh, last, last Thursday. Um, and the idea was we wanted to create a, a version of nouns that specifically is focused on funding public goods. And so we, um, over the summer, we started coordinating um, with folks from um, Medicartel, Pinvala, Radical, Optimism, ClearFund, Gitcoin, and Moloch. Um, and then from Medicartel just started making these like uh, public goods focused SVGs. And so we've got the Chili, the Gitcoin bot, the Moloch ad, the Optimism mouse, the Pinvala stamp, ClearFund bubble, um, Radical seedlings. Um, so we started with this little cohort and we were, and we were just like, okay, what if we just put these things out there? Because these communities, uh, well, one, we're saying that uh, if you buy one of these, of course, you're someone who supports public goods. Maybe you, if you're an Optimism fan, you're going to bid on the Optimism mouse. Um, and then it's just, it, to, to me, it was just like a way that we could maybe gather a group of people uh, in a noun style auction who were very interested in funding public goods. Um, and the first one that we released went for three and a half ETH. Um, and then it went for four and a half ETH and it went for six ETH. And now it's been like kind of, and then eight, eight and a half. And so like, it's just been kind of, it's been kind of working. Um, so in the first week we're now, you know, we're a little over a hundred thousand dollars raised for public goods. Uh, and it seems like it's going to keep going. Um, so this was, a uh, so far a, a cool experiment. And then we're going to start figuring out like how we can onboard other public goods communities that have little mascots that we can get into the system so that there's more head variety. Um, and then now that we've got like 18 or so of these out there, let's start doing some proposals. Because one thing, one way that we want to be distinct from nouns is like, we want to be spending this ETH on like public good and funding things, um, not just accumulating a large treasury. So uh, we're then really interested if people want to come um, and help us figure out how to shape uh, like a proposal system where um, if somebody has an idea for how we should be spending this money, um, we want to make it as easy as possible for those proposals to come in. Uh, maybe we can fund some bribery experimentations within kernel. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun fork. Incredible. The first thing I'll say is uh, with Juan, we're very happy to provide a, a kernelito. Uh, nice. Well head which would be really interesting and just because you you roasted the nouns prior to uh putting this up and i wonder if you have um not given a founder's three of six multi-sig veto rights and how you've thought about that given that that was one of your criticisms of uh, the original noun structure so we uh do you have veto and it's currently in a five of 10 multi-sig with representatives from each of the public goods organizations. Um, and the main reason we want to do that is so that if, uh, um, in whatever, we don't, I don't think we have official bylaws yet, but it's like, uh, we would only veto if a proposal was going to do something that actually wasn't public goods focused. And so we just want to keep the mission aligned. And so the only purpose of the veto um, is to keep the mission aligned with um, the actual spent proposals of the DAO. Um, if there is a way that we can do that by removing our veto or maybe like handing veto over to a different board 
or maybe even veto controlled by like a sub DAO or something were interested. But to, to me, it was useful because it was specifically like we need to keep all spending in line with like the uh, mission. In other words, you have a uh, broader definition of profitable and good. And so you mm -hmm. need some way of figuring that out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, check out Public Nouns. I think Kevin Walkie just released a podcast episode yesterday on Green Pill about Public Nouns. Um, they're cute and they do good things. Okay. Any further questions, comments, jokes, offers for SVG heads, Jason? Yes, please uh, send SVG heads. Is your uh, talk at DEF CON going to be uh, made public available after the talk? Yep. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's it'll be on next Wednesday, and then I think they're all going to be recorded. And then happy to also share slides. I'll share slides after the talk. Um, yeah, that'd be great. A preview, but I'll. Uh, you're the first eyes on the top. So thanks for allowing me to walk through it with you. Andy, this could be a good like hands-on convo of like roasting, having a virtual DAO roasting, right? Yes, yes, indeed. I yeah. really want to do one with DX DAO um, because they're actually like super on-chain and on-chain purists. And so like, they're a really good example of something to strive for. And so if people want to help out with a DX DAO roast, I'd be happy to uh share any like my kind of working document cool uh let's do that if you share that with me i will uh put it in the DAO channel uh because jason the i agree that it is a good format and something i would love to experiment with you can tell already that like uh I, Isaac has made it look very easy, so <laughs> right? Uh, it's uh, the work of a, of a man who has spent too many hours defending proposals on reality.eth, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it requires like, a, like an ability, I think, also just to like spend some time in research yourself, <clears throat> reading other docs and looking at a little bit of like the configurations or, or code. Uh, because those the most like what does the DAO say it does is already like a step that requires some research from people uh, prior to coming to the convo and then what does it actually do is uh, is days of research and nouns is very easy and it's still like even for me like because we forked it and used it for prison art and like it took it took like a day or two at least of like sitting down with the code and really thinking about it and being like okay this is the uh the governance module and they've forked uh compound and they've applied erc 721 so what hang on they've applied what but that's not how compound works and then like it's it's really good because it's well documented but it's like it does take some time to like, grok what what it is that's it is reading a smart contract the the most tedious and time consuming pieces like what would you think is uh, like the I would say longest... um, more like kind of mapping how all the smart contracts come together. Cause like, if you, if you can give me a map of smart contracts and then I can like navigate them, reading them afterwards is like just kind of validating things. But I think developing that map was like kind of the tedious part where it's like, okay, what actually controls what, um, that to me was that it would be cool to get more people, uh, doing. Are there automated tools for these kinds of like UML diagrams of contracts? Um, Maybe if you come across one, that'd be cool. Maybe Tenderly has some cool features for that. Cool. I'll look, I'll look for you. Rishav? Sorry, I missed that. I just see that you're off mute. So I wonder if you have a final question. Uh, no, no, I'm good. Perfect. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. This was uh, really fun. Thanks for having me on.